Okay, uh, well, first of all, thank you, Nicolas, for organizing uh, this workshop and for inviting me. And thank you for everybody uh, for staying here until the last lecture, uh, the last talk. So I know you are tired, but so let me talk about this. Uh, this is a little bit, uh, it's a long title, right? Uh, so l let me explain what, what it means because maybe you are not familiar with this terminology. So basically, this is about, um, so whenever you want to process information, basically you collect the observations in a, in a big matrix, right? And then you do whatever you have to do, right? The problem is that in many applications, uh, there are always some missing values in that matrix. And then whatever algorithm you are going to use later, it's not going to work when you have these missing values. So this is a big problem in practice, right? Uh, so imputation refers to dealing with those missing values, basically filling them in somehow. That, that's what it means, right? And in particular, uh, I, will, I will talk about imputation for time series. The mot my motivation comes from finance, so it's you know, financial time series. And another important thing is that usually people assume Gaussian distributions in, because Gaussian is easy, easy to deal with, but in finance you cannot assume Gaussian. So uh, that's why we deal with heavy tail distributions. Okay? But, so that, that's the description of the title. Okay. So let me start with the motivation. Um, again, I already explained the motivation, right? Sometimes we have missing values and then nothing is going to work. So we need to do something about that. So, and this is a practical thing, right? Sometimes values are not measured for some reason. Sometimes they are measured, but they get lost or they, there is some corruption on the, on the storage. And sometimes they are measured, and, but they are, they are wrong somehow. They could be an outlier or something. So these, uh, there are many applications where you have these missing values, many applications. In, in my particular case, uh, the motivation comes from finance. Uh, and this is true, actually. I remember three years ago downloading uh, you know, stock data from, from Yahoo Finance, and I realized that every now and then you would find a missing value. And so that's how I, I got into this. So um, indeed, sometimes uh, some stocks uh, they are not traded some days. Uh, different countries have different holidays, uh, or maybe the, some stock is illiquid and it's not traded, or, or, or it is traded, but maybe the data that you have is not of good quality. It depends how much you pay for the data, right? So if you get the data from a Bloomberg terminal, probably you will get less missing value. But there are many other applications, like if you have sensors that they are measuring something, sometimes they may fail to measure something. Maybe the battery fails at some point, whatever. Uh, another important application is when, you, when, when people do uh, surveys, right? They design some survey, they give it to the people, and sometimes the people, you know, when they answer the question, sometimes they skip some questions. And then you collect these, you go back to the lab, and then you realize you have missing values. What do you do? So one option is to throw away the samples with missing values, but if you do that, you are at the end you're going to end up throwing away a lot of uh, useful information. So, so that's the idea. So, um, yeah, that's what I was uh, explaining. Now, of course, you cannot do magic, right? I mean, how can you fill in the missing values? You cannot do magic. So, basically, the idea is that we want to fill in those values based on some properties of the data. There has to be something there, some structure that you, you need to know that, right? Otherwise, you cannot do m magic. So in particular, in, in, in our case here today, I'm going to use the fact that time series, usually they have some, some structure along the time domain, right? So that's going to be our, our structure that we are going to use to do the filling. And then, um, yeah. So, but anyway, there are many imputation schemes. Eh? This is a very old topic. Some imputation uh, methods are totally heuristic, ad hoc, and some of them, they are totally wrong. It's better even not to do it than to do it sometimes, if you do it that bad. But we want to do it in a sound way, a statistical way, right? We want to do it in a way that if you fill in the, the, the missing values, you don't destroy the statistics of the original time series. That, that's, that's the idea. And as I said, uh, many works assume Gaussian. We, we cannot do that here. So this is the focus of, of this presentation, OK? Statistical, uh, statistically sound methods for time series imputation and the heavy tail um, distribution. Okay, 
Let me tell you, just for fun, th this is a very common example of imputation. It's totally different from uh, our topic today, but just for fun. Uh, this is the Netflix problem that s started many years ago, um, I think 15 years ago or something. Basically, the idea is that Netflix, they had this uh, big matrix, right, with the rating by different users on different movies. Right? If, if a user watches a movie, then it will give a rating from one to five. But of course, as you can imagine, most users, I mean, a given user has not watched most of the movies, right? So basically, this matrix is going to be pretty much empty. It's going to be full of missing values. So the, the problem in Netflix, uh, they wanted to recommend movies to the users. So somehow they wanted to fill in those missing values so that if they fill in a value and there is a five, they can recommend that movie to you. But how do they do that? Well, in this case, of course, you cannot do magic. So in this case, there was some structure that they, they exploited. And they, uh, they ex the, we are not going to get into the details, but the structure is that you can argue that this huge matrix is actually low rank. That was the trick. So basically, you can write this matrix as the product uh, of two very thin matrices. So that, that was the trick. Once you realize that it's low rank, you can actually fill in the missing values. So they had a competition, actually, years ago, right? And, and the, winning, the winning method uh, basically was this, combined with many other things, right? Anyway, this is just for fun. Now, in our case, we are going to use uh, the structure along the time domain. It's totally different from the low rank structure. It's a different thing. So basically, the idea is that well, yt is the time series, and there is some structure. In this case, it's a random walk. So uh, yt is equal to yt minus 1 plus some innovation. So there is clearly some structure. Uh, there are many other models, like an uh, AR model, right? In an AR model, well, yt depends on the past few values plus some random innovation as well, right? So clearly, if one of these guys is missing, you know, you can have a good guess on how to fill in, right? So that's the idea. So let me tell you a little bit about um, different uh, imputation methods. Just hot deck imputation is like one of the oldest methods. Basically, what they do is just basically, if there is a missing value, they take some other value around and they put it there. That's it, right? Well, of course. In some applications, maybe it worked, but in some others, it could be really bad. Uh, mean imputation is something that sounds very natural. Imagine you have a time series, right? And there are a few missing values. So you could do the following. You look at the observed values. You take the mean, and you put the mean in the missing values. It sounds totally reasonable, right? Yeah, it sounds like a good idea, but it's really bad, because it, it distorts all the statistics of the signal. And uh, I can show you, it's very easy once you realize. So imagine you, we have k1 observations and k2, of, uh, k2 missing values, na, not available. This means not available. Okay. So k1 observed and k2, they are missing. Well, of course, if I want to compute the variance of these, of these numbers, I will just discard the missing values. Of course, they are missing. And I will just take the ones that I know. I'm assuming here IID, I guess. So I would take K, the K1 values, and, and I estimate my variance, you know, 1 over K1, summation of all these K1 observed values. That's my estimation. OK, good. But imagine now we impute with the mean, and then we compute the variance. So now, where we had missing values, now I put the mu. Once I impute this mean, I'm going to estimate the variance, forgetting that I imputed, right? Well, look what happens now. Because I don't throw away these guys, now I have k1 plus k2 numbers. So my estimation is going to be 1 over k1 plus k2. And this summation is for the, the first samples. And this summation, of course, that's the problem, right? That the summation corresponding to these terms is just zero. So basically, at the end, this, this summation is the same as this. But this one is divided by k1. And this one is divided by k1 plus k2. So it's totally distorted. It's going to be underestimated. So you see, it's very, danger it's very dangerous. Uh, you can easily make mistakes when you do imputations. So this is really bad. It sounds like a good idea, but it's bad. 
So basically, all these, all these interpolation tricks that you can think of, they, maybe they work for some applications, but, but that's not what we are looking for, because they are not statistically good. And, and I'm going to show you a plot. Look at this. Basically, I took some, uh, some probably the SP500, some index, and I plot here the price over time, right? And then what I did is I removed a block of, um, of prices, and I imputed according to different methods. This is a, well, this is a very popular imputation method. It's called LOCF, last of observation carried forward. Basically, I just repeat the last observation, bam, 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 until I, I have more observations. So there is a big jump. It looks quite horrible, but in many, in finance, they use that all the time, by the way. So here, uh, you could say, okay, let me do something better, some linear interpolation. But you can see it's totally fake. I mean, all this is fake. Here you can say, okay, let me use some spline. Still, it's fake, right? It's fake and it destroys the statistical uh, information. So um, this is what we are looking for. If you look at this, this looks natural, right? Ex that's what we want, okay? That's the idea. So let's try to do that. Let's try to do that. So in order to do a proper uh, statistical imputation, we need we can think of two steps. The first step is to actually characterize you know, the statistical properties of the time series. Okay? Estimate the, the parameters of the PDF or whatever. Right? Estimate, characterize it. Once you characterize it, then you can do the imputation. But the first step is to characterize it. So let's do the first step, which is the, mo the most difficult. Actually, when, once you characterize the, the time series, the imputation is easy. So this is the difficult part. Okay, so let's start from a simple example, and then we, we, we make it more complicated. Simple example. Let's assume we have IID, observations, and Gaussian. It cannot be easier than this, right? So what do you do? Well, basically, we want to, the, you know, a Gaussian distribution is characterized by the, by the mean and the, and the variance, so we want to, uh, you know, estimate the mean and the variance. We're going to use maximum likelihood, you know, a very common way of estimating parameters. The idea is that you write the, you evaluate the PDF of the Gaussian on the observations that you have. Uh, in this case, they are IID, so we multiply all these, and then we take the log, and that's the likelihood. And then you want to maximize this with respect to mu and sigma, okay? That's maximum likelihood. But now we have missing values. But because it's IID, basically what we're going to do is throw away the, the missing values and just keep the observed ones. That's it. That's, that's going to be the maximum likelihood. So you see, here, actually, I only multiply the, the PDF evaluated in the observations that we have, not the ones that we don't have. So it's, it's, not, it's nothing new. It's, uh, you know, basically, we just use the observed ones. That's it. Um, not only that, this, is, uh, the ma this maximization has a nice cross form solution, which basically is the sample mean and the sample variance estimator. But, of course, you are only using the observations, the observed ones, okay? Okay, very nice. That's the Gaussian case, IID. But as I said before, in many applications, Gaussian distribution is not satisfied many, in many big data and finance applications. So we are going to assume heavy, a heavy tail distribution, okay? And in finance, for example, it is totally true. In finance, if you take the, here, I, basically, I take uh, some, uh, some prices of some stock, I compute the returns, and I plot the histogram. And then this blue line is, uh, I'm trying to fit with the blue line a Gaussian. It doesn't fit at all. Basically, you see the Gaussian quickly, the tails quickly go to zero. But actually, the real distribution has heavy tails. That's why it's called heavy tails, because the tails are very heavy. They decay very slowly. Okay. So anyway, that happens in many applications, also in big data. Yes, sure. Um, so I, I work with missing data a lot. Ah. My advisor actually is probably the folk that you sign, you, 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 you reference. Oh, OK. So I brought this to the slide. So this is actually part of my dissertation. Um, so maybe you could help me to, because I don't work with financial data. Um, I, I, like, for example, you are talking about the stock price on Google or whatever. You only have one time series. Like, I assume that the data, the missing data you have are not, like, missing, not at random. 
like either it's missing completely random or missing at random. Well, so yeah. What's, what's the point of doing imputation? You can just ignore. Uh, you don't have to model missingness at all. Okay. Yeah. 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 Let me hold this question for for two more slides, okay. because in the IID case, you are right. In the IID case, if you have something missing, don't use it, and that's it. The problem is when when there is some temporal structure, then you cannot just throw away things, because if you throw away things, no, I, I don't throw away things. I mean, you still use the available data points, and you just don't have to model that part. Like even without ah, I understand. Definitely, definitely. The the processing that you do later, if you if you are smart enough and you can design whatever processing you do to take into account missing data somehow properly, then yes, you don't need to impute. Yes, but the point is that uh, we, we don't want to be. Maybe we don't want to design all the algorithms in a complicated way to take into account that some values are missing. So. Imputation is just for to impute but so that you don't need to worry about that. If you impute the data already doing some complicated things, I mean, you are modeling your time series and you try to estimate parameter, even the parameter is going to impute the data. And that's somehow already... So, okay. Yes. So if you are going to estimate the covariance metrics, if that's all, all you're going to do, then yes, you, you can actually estimate the covariance metrics taking into account the missing values and you will use some EM. Yes, you can do that. But maybe you are doing some other processing later. Maybe not only estimation of the covariance metrics. Who knows what you are going to do with the data later. So the imputation allows you to you know, solve that problem of the missing data. And then it's, it's, com it's clean. And then you pass it to the next stage. But definitely, if you can take into account missing values already, yes, then do it. Yes. And in fact, yeah, we, we also we also do, do these things for, for estimation of covariance matrices. Definitely, yeah, this you can do that. that. Like the benefit compared to other cases where, like for example, clinical trials or you do surveys, right? So the government release the data for public use. I mean, they fill in the data. People like from everywhere they can download the data and use it. I mean, there's a big benefit of making the data complete. But in your case, I don't see the benefits. I mean, maybe there's benefits. As I said, it. It depends on what you do later. If you are just going to estimate the covariance metrics and you can deal with missing values, fine, do it. But depending what you do later, maybe you didn't design the, 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 the method to deal with missing values. You were not thinking about that when you design whatever method. So this allows you to still be able to use that method. So basically, you separate into two stages. First, impute, and then do whatever you do. But if you want to do it together, that's fine. OK. Um, so yes, we were talking about the Gaussian case. And now let's do it with the student, uh, with a heavy tail case, but still IID. So in this case, uh, we, we use, basically, we need to use some heavy tail distribution, right? There are many, uh, there are many heavy tail distributions. When, which one you choose is not really that important in practice. The important thing is that you use a heavy tail one. So in particular, we use the student T, which is a family of, of heavy tail distributions. Uh, they have one more parameter to control how heavy the tail is. So in this case, you can see not only we have the mu and the sigma, but also the nu. The nu tells you how heavy it is. And in fact, if nu goes to infinity, it becomes Gaussian. OK, so how do we do here the, the estimation of the parameters? Again, let's do maximum likelihood, the same we did before. So basically, you it's IID, so you can throw away the missing values. So basically, you just take into account the observed ones. You write this PDF. You evaluate the PDF in the observed values. Take the log and maximize. Fine. Fine, except that this doesn't have a closed form solution. So that's the first difficulty that you encounter with heavy tail. OK, then, then what do you do? Well, there are different things you can do. But one way is to realize that the student t can be expressed in, in a hierarchical way. You can, you can include some uh, hidden variables that have a nice distribution. And then condition on the hidden variables, it turns out that this student t is just a Gaussian. So once you realize of that, you can say, OK, let me use this hierarchical uh, description instead of, instead of this one. 
Uh, and you can do that, but of course then you need to deal with these uh, hidden variables. And the way to do that is with the EM algorithm. You can, do, you can use EM to deal with that. If we do that, we are going to be able to get a cross-form solution. So anyway, we do that. Uh, it gets nasty, right? You need to do all the, all the, all the mathematical development. Because basically, basically what EM is going to do, let me go back. What EM is, uh, EM is an iterative method. In, I guess everybody probably knows EM, but it's an iterative method. At each iteration, you do two, two steps. One step is uh, expectation. It's called expectation step. Basically, you're going to approximate this by another function. And in the second step, you maximize the approximation. And then you, you do that iteratively. So this is the first step, expectation. Basically, uh, this Q function is the approximating function. And basically, uh, you take the log of the complete, this, uh, complete PDF, right? And, but you need to take expected value that gets complicated, OK? Expected value of the, of, the, of the hidden variables, condition on the observed ones. So it gets nasty. So, but anyway, you do it. And at the end, well, you can get a, a, an expression that is clean. And this, and now you need to maximize this, this guy with respect to the parameters. Luckily, it can be done in closed form. Good. Thanks to the EM. Yeah, forget the details. That doesn't matter. Uh, the maximization of that Q function, nice. Closed form solution. And you can write it, pam, pam, pam. And actually, mu is like a... Like a like a sample mean, but with some weights, and this sigma is also like a like a sample estimation, but with some weights. So it's kind of nice. Fine. So this is just to warm up. Now let's do the thing that we really want to do. The the thing that we really want to do is forget about the IID. That complicates things. Let's assume, for the sake of you know, simplicity, that we have an AR1 model. So basically, uh, it's something like that, right? Now you can see uh, each sample is, is somehow related to the, the, the previous one and also affects the next one. So you cannot just throw away things because things are connected. So it, the now it's going to get complicated. So OK, let's try it. By the way, now, now the parameters we want to estimate, we have four. Now we have this, this psi 0, psi 1, and then the variance of the innovation and also the how, how heavy the tail is in, of the innovation. OK, so we have four parameters, but that's fine. Let's do the maximum likelihood formulation now. Let's see what happens. Well, what happens is that we write the PDF, we evaluate the PDF in the observed values, but there are some other values that are missing. How do you deal with that? You actually need to integrate them out. The missing ones, you need to integrate them because you don't have them. So you need to integrate them. And then you take the log and maximize. Now, the problem is even worse than before. Because before, in the IID heavy tail case, at least we could write this expression. The problem was that we couldn't maximize it in closed form. The, but now the problem is that we cannot even write this. This integral, you cannot write it in closed form. So you don't have a closed form expression to maximize. So it's really nasty. Then you say, OK, let's see if I can do this hierarchical um, decomposition. and and let's see if that helps. But now it gets more complicated because now the hidden variables are going to be not only these taus, but also the missing, the missing values. They are going to be also hidden variables. Fine. So then you, it gets complicated, right? It gets complicated, but you, you, you try to do EM. EM, OK. You write the PDF. Uh, at the end, you can write it in a nice way. And th the difficult part is this, right? When you want to compute the Q function, Basically, you need to compute this expected value. You try to do it. You spend, uh, you manipulate things. And at, at the end, the only thing you need to compute at the end is this guy. That's the only thing we need to do. Expected value of, of this vector, that this is a vector of the sufficient statistics. The problem is that it cannot be done in closed form. Even this simple expected value, it cannot be done in some form, in closed form. So we are a bit stuck here. Then, well, but there are ways to do it. There is something called uh, stochastic EM. Basically, in the stochastic EM, what you're going to do is you're going to approximate the expected value. Instead of doing analytically, what you're going to do is you're going to do it like numerically, basically. You're going to generate 
mm, realizations of, of this conditional distribution and then you're gonna take like a sample mean okay but you need to you need to uh, generate randomly uh, from this distribution fine the problem is that even that you cannot do okay you it's if you if you write it down you can actually not you cannot generate random realizations of this distribution okay <laughs> so but anyway there are techniques to do it so um, yeah that's what I'm saying you we cannot even generate realizations of this distribution but there are some techniques right uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, methods basically in particular we use here the heaps uh, sampling method so the idea is that instead of generating uh, jointly all the all the hidden variables which are in this case the taus and the missing missing values instead of generating jointly those guys which we we don't know how to do we're going to we're going to use the gibbs sampling and what it does the gibbs sampling is it generates uh, only one of them condition on the other ones fix fix on the other one you generate this and then you fix this and you generate tau but of course if you do that it's not the same as generating them jointly if you generate one marginal the other marginal that's not the same as generating them jointly right but w basically uh, what the Gibbs sampling method does is it it generates this alternating thing for a long time until it converges to and once it converges what you are generating is like the joint distribution okay anyway nothing new this is a uh, Gibbs sampling but you need to do it properly so that it works and in this case it can be done properly so at the end at the end the only thing we need to do is to draw the tau given the all the y's and this is trivia because the tau is just a, is a gamma distribution and then uh, if given the gamma and the observations draw the missing again this is trivia because this is just gaussian so basically we draw this pam 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 until it converges and then that's it that's going to give us one realization of the joint good so that's it that's the the stochastic em applied here it can it, it can be done and it works very well so at the end is three methods right you need to si simulate these joint things using the gibbs sampling and then you approximate this is when you approximate the expected value with this summation and then the maximization step i'm not going to give you the maximization step but you can compute it in closed form it's very nasty but it can be computed in, in closed form. So that's it. So once we have characterized the, the PDF, right? Once we have characterized all these parameters, we can do the imputation. How do you do the imputation? Well, basically we have characterized this. So once we have characterized this, we, we can just draw the missing values from this. And that gives us one imputation. And and if you want multiple imputations, you, you can do this several times, and then you get multiple imputations, OK? So that's it. That's it. I want to show you some numerical results. Basically, here I took uh, some real data, SP500, uh, and, and I'm trying to fit it with the example that we saw, right? A student T, AR1. OK, so we have four parameters, right? So indeed, if you do this procedure, it converges very quickly pretty much 40 iterations everything has converged basically oh by the way we know already that the the log prices they follow a random walk so actually the psi one in the AR model we know that it should be a one indeed uh, it's phi one is here it quickly converges to something that is like 0 0.9988 so it's like one right so fine works fine this is a uh, everything converges and the new converges to something around five so definitely heavy tail five is still very heavy tail so good that we are assuming a heavy tail good and now let me show you one more plot that i think is quite interesting okay i, I want to test you right look at this so this is a real uh, data right from the sp500 and i plot here right so we have uh, you can see four plots right basically um i have in what, what i have done here i have removed some block and imputed can can you recognize where is the imputation here with the naked eye can you see which part i imputed or not it looks 
it looks very natural. Just to help you a little bit, I'm going to draw in a different color the part that I imputed. I don't know if you can see it. You see the blue? The blue is the part that I remove, and then I impute it, right? I impute it multiple times, right? So does it look natural to you? One of them is the real one, by the way. One of them is the original one, and the other three are imputed. Anybody wants to guess? So who thinks this is the real one? Who thinks this is the real one? Nobody wants to say anything? <laughs> who thinks this is the real one? Yes? And who thinks this is the real one? Interesting. So the majority of the people think that this is the real one. Some people think this is the real one. Actually, this is the real one. So anyway, j just to show that if you do it like this, statistically, you cannot tell the difference, right? Both visually, you cannot tell the difference, and, and mathematically, you know, statistically, you cannot tell the difference because those imputations uh, you know, satisfy the statistics of the original part of the data. Anyway, so that's it. This is, uh, by the way, I come from uh, HKUST in Hong Kong as well, on the other side of Hong Kong, basically. So this is where we are. So thank you very much. So, if, if, can you say it again? If it will be... Well, for example, with images, it's possible to tell whether an image is fake uh, by certain statistical properties of the underlying data structure. And I'm curious here, I mean, probably people wouldn't be faking this type of uh, financial data, but I'm, I'm wondering if this means that, uh, that, that it would be relatively straightforward to generate fake data. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think in finance it's very easy to, to, to fake data. Yeah, yeah. Basically, there are many models in finance very complicated models to try to explain the data, right? Not just the a AR1, right? Very complicated models. So you can take any of those models and put some parameters and generate the residuals randomly, and that's it. And you draw something. And, and you know, if you choose, you know, meaningful parameters, then, yeah. Yeah, because they were not statistically consistent. Yeah, yeah. I think once you do it a statist in a statistically consistent way, it's, un well, maybe some expert who, who spends every day looking at the, at the charts can tell the difference, but... But in this case, we are making some assumptions on, on the model. For example, here, right, I was making the assumption of AR1 model, which is good enough to, you know, to fake it. To fake it. But so you are making this, that, that assumption, the model. The model that you use. So uh, another way to generate fake data is with uh, deep learning, uh, the, the adversary neural network, right? That's what they use for images. So in principle, uh, you could use it also for any kind of application, yeah.